Well, good morning again, and I'd like to welcome those that are joining us in our live stream as well. Today we are continuing on our journey through the Bible as we have come to the last division of the Old Testament, the prophets. And so today we will be looking at the first of the prophets, and that is Isaiah. And so our scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 1, and we will read verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Let us pray as we seek God's guidance and direction in this time of together. Lord, we come and we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will just guide and direct us in this time of study. Lord, we acknowledge that we are utterly dependent upon you. And if we're going to really understand what this book of Isaiah is about, we need you to have your Holy Spirit teach us. And so, Lord, we invite you to come and to instruct our hearts today. Lord, I ask the anointing power of your Holy Spirit, for I confess I can never do this in the flesh. I ask, Lord, that you would just use me as an instrument of your grace. I ask, Lord, that you would cleanse me of all my iniquity and that you would make me a vessel that is fit for your use. Lord, you know where each of us are on our journey. You know what it is we're needing to hear from you today. And so we just invite you to speak to our hearts. We want you to be honored and glorified. And it's in that precious name of our Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let me ask you, have you ever stood on the rim of the Grand Canyon. And if you have, then you know how majestic and inspiring it is. You know how deep and wide, how vast and vibrant, with layer upon layer of colorful rocks. Well, Isaiah is the Grand Canyon of the Bible. It is a majestic and inspiring book. It is deep and it's wide. It's vast and it's vibrant with layer upon layer of colorful, profound prophecies. And it's in Isaiah that he gives us these amazing prophetic visions of the Messiah of Jesus himself. In fact, the book of Isaiah is even being called the gospel according to Isaiah. And even though it was written 700 years before Christ, it has some of the most amazing prophetic passages that point to the coming of Jesus. It's also interesting just to note that Isaiah is exactly in the middle of the Bible. And it's even been called a miniature Bible. Just as there are 66 books in the Bible, there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah is sort of like a biblical root 66, where you experience one wonder after another. And just as there are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, the book of Isaiah divides in exactly the same way. The first section of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 39, and these are the prophecies of God's judgment. And then in chapters 40 through 66, 27 chapters, they are essentially the message of salvation just like the New Testament. The New Testament begins with the story of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the one who came to announce the coming of the Messiah. 
In fact, Mark tells us and declares that the ministry of John the Baptist is the beginning of the gospel. And then he quotes from Isaiah 40 to confirm that, the very first chapter of that second section. And here's what we read in Isaiah. A voice of one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And after Mark quotes part of that, he says, And so John came. And so Isaiah, as you come into the second section, he begins in the same way that the New Testament begins. And then when you come to the last chapter of Isaiah, in chapter 66, the Lord proclaims, As the new heavens and the new earth I make will endure before me. And you find that same declaration in the last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 21. And John describes his vision saying, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And so the second section of Isaiah ends and begins just like the New Testament does. Now Isaiah is an amazing prophet. And yet it's also amazing how little we know about him. His name means salvation of Jehovah. And as he tells us right at the beginning... His ministry took place during the reign of four kings in Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he prophesies at a time when the northern kingdom of Israel was, destro was destroyed by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom of Judah has plunged into idolatry. Isaiah is also a contemporary of Amos and Hosea and Micah. And while we're not 100% certain how Isaiah died, it does appear that he died as a martyr. In the Jerusalem Talmud, it says that Isaiah was in hiding from King Manasseh and so he went and he hid in the hollow of a cedar tree. And when the king discovered that's where his presence was, he ordered the tree to be sawn in two, indicating that Isaiah was sawn, sawed along with that tree. In fact, that may even be what the book of Hebrews is referring to in chapter 11 when it gives us those heroes of our faith and what so many of them endured. And in verse 37, it even says they were sawed in two. And so Isaiah may have even given his very life because of his faithfulness to what God had called him to do. You see, Isaiah lived during a time of national distress. A time when the ugly, wicked side of our human nature was visible. In fact, we may find the book of Isaiah to be extremely relevant to the very age in which we live. It doesn't take very long looking into the news to see that we are living in a time when the very ugly side of our human nature is more pronounced than perhaps it has been in our lifetime. And so this book opens with Isaiah being indignant over the nation's rebellion against the Lord. It simply doesn't make sense. In fact, it never makes sense. Why would someone who knows the Lord willingly choose to rebel against him? In fact, it goes beyond Isaiah's understanding. And it goes beyond the realm of of his tolerance as well. 
In fact, he describes the people this way. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. See, he's saying even an animal knows where its food comes from. How can you be so ignorant and foolish not to know that God is the one who is your protector and your defender, the one who takes care of you and gives you everything? It goes beyond his understanding. And then when you come into chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision of God. And he sees him in all of his glory and his holiness. We read, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraph, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so Isaiah was in the temple and he has this amazing vision of God. And it's interesting, it took place in the year when King Uzziah died. There is a vacancy on the earthly throne. And yet Isaiah is reminded when he has a vision of an eternal throne where there will never be a vacancy. It is that reminder that God is in absolute control and that his throne, he will always be seated upon it. And then in his vision, the doorpost and the threshold of the temple began to shake. The temple was filled with smoke. Can you just put yourself in Isaiah's place? He's had this vision of the Lord in all of his glory. The temple began shaking and it's filled with smoke. How would you respond to that? What did Isaiah do? Well, we read, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You see, when Isaiah was confronted with the holiness and the majesty of God, it made him keenly aware of just how sinful we are. And so he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Among a people of unclean lips. And it leaves him wondering, how can a holy God do anything with such unholy people other than just destroy us because of our rebellion and disobedience? And yet right away, one of the seraphs reminds him of God's grace and is the fact that his guilt has been taken away and atoned for. And then you come to the second half of the book. Isaiah has been reminded of just how holy God is and how unholy we are. The next thing is he is aware of our human helplessness. He states it this way. All men are like grass and all their glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. And so he reminds us that we're temporal, just like the grass and the flowers. As I read that, I was thinking of my lawn. And up until about two weeks ago, the grass was so green and lush, you needed to mow it just about every four or five days or it would get too tall. And now you walk through the lawn and it crunches underneath your feet. It's just withered. He says, that's how we are. We're like the flowers that bloom and then they fall. 
I bought my wife some roses, and boy, they look beautiful for a few days, but then pretty soon they start drooping over and the petals start falling off of them. And he reminds us that's what we're like. We're utterly powerless. We're completely helpless. And yet that's not the end of the story because he begins with this growing revelation of the love of God and his salvation. And it's found in someone who is to come, the Messiah. Initially, it's an image that is dim, but it begins growing brighter and clearer until it practically leaps off of the pages when you come to Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. And he tells us the Messiah is not what we would expect. In one verse, he's high and lifted up. And in the next, he is disfigured and marred beyond recognition. And he tells us how he became so disfigured. Isaiah 53, verse 3, he says, He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. And all you have to do is look at the ministry of Jesus and you begin seeing exactly who he's talking about. This is one of the passages that when Philip met the man from Ethiopia out in the desert and he asked, who is the prophet writing about him? Philip began at that place to tell him the good news about Jesus because this is all about him. You come to verse 5 and it becomes even much clearer. It says, he was pierced for our transgressions. You have the wounds from the nails. You have the sword in his side. You have the thorns on his uh, brow. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And boy, get this. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Then he continues in verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Verses 8 and 9. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. And so Jesus was crucified with criminals. The wicked. And then he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea. See, this is not a glorified Messiah coming in power and glory, but one who pours out his life unto death. The one who took our sins upon himself. And so the very same God of transcendent glory in whose presence Isaiah confessed, I am ruined is also the suffering servant who gives his life as an atoning sacrifice. And so Isaiah sees beyond the darkness to the dawning of a day of righteousness when the glory of the Lord will fill the earth. And in chapter 61, he announces the year of the Lord's favor. It's the same passage that Jesus read from when he stood there in the synagogue in Nazareth. Right at the beginning of his ministry, and Jesus read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in chapter 62, Isaiah announces that Zion will have a new name. And he even announces her coming redemption 
when he says, see your Savior comes. His reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. And then in chapter 63 through 66, he announces the day of God's vengeance and his redemption, his coming salvation, judgment, and hope. And in chapter 65, he gives us a picture of the new heavens and the new earth, just as John does in Revelation. Both Isaiah and Revelation present a dichotomy of Jesus' greatness and yet his power and his humility. In Revelation chapter 4, John sees a vision of the throne of God. And then he says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. And then he hears all heaven proclaiming, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You have the throne and then you have the Lamb. You have power and you have humility. You have king and a servant. And we see all of these contrasts brought together in the book of Isaiah. In chapter 6, he sees him seated on a throne high and exalted. And in chapter 53, he sees him oppressed and afflicted and led like a lamb to the slaughter. And all of that, Isaiah reminds us that God's ways are not our ways. God does things differently than we would do them. For he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's methods are not the same methods that we would use. And so God's method of breaking human rebellion is not by power and might but by love, through a suffering servant who would give his life as a ransom for us. See, God's message is not condemnation, but it's grace and it's forgiveness. And yet some of the most poetic and beautiful passages of Isaiah are his messianic prophecies of the coming Messiah. We've looked at a few of those. Let me just mention them. We saw that John the Baptist was announced as the forerunner of Jesus. Jesus announced that he was anointed to preach the good news. You have the suffering of Jesus that we've looked at briefly in Isaiah 53. But it's also Isaiah who tells us that Jesus would be born of a virgin. He says, Chapter 7, 14, the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, one of the things that Satan has continued to attack is the virgin birth of Jesus. I've heard it all through my life. And in fact, a lot of biblical scholars today will tell you that this passage really isn't talking about Jesus. Now, I have to tell you, I have a problem with that because when you read in Matthew's account of the gospel, he confirms that this passage is talking about Jesus. He quotes from it and he applies it to Jesus. Now, I have to ask you, who are you going to believe? Some theologian who doesn't even know God or Matthew who is one of the disciples of Jesus? an apostle of Christ. Now, I don't even think that's a question that requires much intelligence to answer in all honesty. It's not even a question of intelligence. It's just a, simply a question that says, are you going to believe an eyewitness or someone who doesn't even know what he's talking about? And somehow we get this idea if someone has a title in front of their name or behind their name that it makes them this great authority. 
You're not an authority on the scriptures if you don't know the God who wrote them. And he says that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And that's Jesus. Matthew makes it clear. And he'll be called Emmanuel, God with us. He also tells us that Jesus would be the rock of offense. He says, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Paul even quotes that in Romans, confirming again that Jesus is that stumbling block to the Jews. And you even see that in the ministry of Jesus, especially with the religious class. And unfortunately, you see the same thing happening today. Even within the religious class of the church, where they are stumbling at what Jesus said. We live in a day and age where people think that you read the Gospels and that it's multiple choice. That somehow you take the parts that you want and the parts that you don't want, you just disregard them. God never said this is multiple choice. This is His Word. And so people stumble at Jesus and what He says. And I'm going to tell you, you read what Jesus says, He says some really hard things. It wasn't all easy. He raises the bar of how we're to be living. And then in Isaiah chapter 9, he presents Jesus as a great light. He says, and the people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. And both Matthew and John confirm that that's talking about Jesus that he is the light who came into the world, that he is that great light. And then you have that beautiful passage we so often read, especially during Advent or Christmas, in chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, when he says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And so you read the Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, they all confirm that that's exactly who he's talking about, is Jesus, that he is God with us. And Isaiah proclaimed that the deaf would hear and the blind would see in chapter 29, in that day the deaf will hear, the eyes of the blind will see. That's confirmed when you read the Gospels that Jesus restored the sight of the blind, that he made those who were deaf that they could hear. And he even reminds us that Jesus would be whipped. In Isaiah 50, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And again, confirmed in Matthew chapter 26, that passage is talking about Jesus. You see, Isaiah truly reminds us that the purpose of the Old Testament is so that we might recognize the Messiah and that we would receive him into our lives when we've recognized him. And so he paints this amazing prophetic picture of the coming Messiah. I want to encourage you, read from Isaiah and nothing else. You need to read Isaiah chapter 53 today. And as you read that passage, you think about Jesus and every part of it that you remember from the ministry of Jesus. You need to remember that and how God 700 years before Jesus ever came, he gave us all of these details about how Jesus would suffer on that cross to buy our atonement, to pay our sin debt so that we can experience the grace 
of God. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we come before you and we thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that we will just get more and more into your word and that we will begin reading it and finding out what a tremendous message it is that you have for us. And that Isaiah gives us that promise of grace. It's written on it from the very beginning through the end of the book. Lord, we pray that we will hear your call to come now. And let us reason together. Lord, that our sins would be cleansed and made as white as snow, even though they are red. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the Lamb of God that is so portrayed in Isaiah that he gave his life as a ransom for us. And it's in that precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing song.